Well, uh, like I said, the, the title of the session is Helping to Recreate a Grand County Active Transportation Best Practices. And I'm gonna take a second here to say thank you to the summit sponsors. Um, the Move Utah Summit would not be uh, possible without the sponsors. So we really appreciate your support in, in bringing together all of these fantastic people and topics um, that are really important to, to all of the work that, that we do. Um, one quick point of logistics before I introduce the speakers is please keep yourself on mute. Um, we do have Q&A at the end of the session and if you would like to unmute yourself to ask, I just ask that you please raise your hand first or put it right into the chat and that works as well. Um, I think there are going to be some good questions based on the, the, the two folks that we have speaking today. Um, so our first speaker is going to be Kim Schaepert, who is the Executive Director of the Moab Trails Alliance, and then we'll have Maddie Logowitz, who's the Transportation Director of the Grand County Active Trails. Um, briefly about Kim, like I said, she's the Executive Director of the Moab Trails Alliance, or MTA. Um, formerly, as an elected official to the Grand County Council, she co-founded Trail Mix in 1999, the extremely successful non-motorized trails committee. And through MTA, she wrote grants and put together funding packages for the development of 150 miles of mountain bike specific single track trails in Grand County and for $22 million worth of paved path infrastructure known as the Mo North Moab Recreation Areas Alternative Transportation System. This ATS mitigates user conflicts by safely segregating motors and cyclists, pedestrians and wheelchairs while providing access to many of Moab's world-class recreational sites. Kim says, quote, I was thinking not only of the community and its needs, but of me as I get older and of my grandkids as they learn how to ride bikes and begin exploring our fantastic backyard. It was deeply personal, but I'm happy to share. Kim, thank you. And thank you for all the work that you've done already. Um, and our next speaker is Madeline or Maddie Lobowitz. Uh, she's the director of Grand County Active Transportation and Trails, also known as Moab Trail Mix. She got her start building grant excuse me, she got her start building granite staircases up Colorado 14ers and has been hooked on trail building ever since. Currently, she works with the local community and land managers to enhance recreation opportunities and promote stewardship on the public lands areas around Moab, Utah. Madeline has a degree in environmental studies from Oberlin College and a background in ecological research, and she was the 2016 community artist for Arches and Canyonlands National Parks. Maddie, welcome to you as well. Thank you both for being here. Um, I want to turn the time over to Kim first to spend about 20 minutes and then Maddie to spend about 20 minutes before we open up that Q&A. Um, so Kim, would you dive into the history of Grand County's active transportation landscape and, and kind of where that's moved to today? Okay. Can you hear me out there? So, um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Great. Um, okay, as she said, I'm Kim Shepard. Um, I've lived in Moab for 35 years. Um, during that time, you can imagine, we have seen lots of changes. Um, not everybody thinks that they're probably for the best, and a lot of us think that um, we've done a lot of really good things. The, um, the stuff I am proudest about is the um, non-motorized trails revolution that started back in 1999. So I'm gonna tell you about that. So there I was, a newly elected county official trying to figure out how I was gonna make my mark in the world. And the, my council members um, decided that they wanted to start a committee for motors, for the Jeepers. And they wanted to figure out how to clean up the spaghetti system of roads on the backcountry map that they were all using. And I thought, well, if they're gonna do that for the motor people, why don't we do a trail for the non-motorized people? And so I asked my fellow council members if they'd support that. And they said, well, sure, why not? And so I called the city um, and I was an elected official in Grand County, Grand County Council. So I called the city and their city planner was, is David, was David Olson. And I said, what do you think about starting a non-motorized trail committee? And he goes, that's a great idea. So we had the city on board. And we had our first meeting in December of 1999. So back then, nobody really had much of a plan. And we were thinking mostly of dirt. But we um, also decided to um, think about other, expand our horizons. And um, maybe some people would have some other ideas. So we called in the BLM. And they showed up at our first meeting also. 
And the one other trail committee that we knew about was Trails 2000 in Colorado. They came to our meeting and handed us a hundred dollar check. So then we knew we were on the road to success. <laughs> so we um, came up with our name, Trail Mix, because it was a mix of hikers and bikers and horses. Um, we started developing really strong partnerships and BLM was key. Most of the land in Grand County is BLM lands. Um, they helped us um, come up with new ideas. They helped us with um, backup um, cost share agreements that helped fund some uh, early trail mix stuff. And we, in our meetings, we sat and we brainstormed projects. And some of the projects um, we came up with back in the day in 2000 were a path along Highway 128, which follows the Colorado River through Grand County. And we had a gentleman that joined our group. He was actually the president of the airport board, um, Bob Dalla, and he was an engineer. So he gave us some free help and gave us an estimate, worked up a whole estimate for that pathway of $5 million back in 2000. Well, by the time it got built, it was way more than that, but it was a start. Um, we also came up with the idea of a 191 underpass. Um, UDOT was gonna widen the highway from the two lane road that it used to be, and they were gonna make it into the road, the four lanes um, that it is right now. And they were having a scoping meeting. So they invited the public and we went to the meeting and we said, what about if you're gonna be building a highway like that, we're not gonna be able to get across it on our bicycles to go ride Gemini bridges. What about putting an underpass under the road? And Bevan Wilson was the head of the transportation commission back then. And he looked at me and I looked at him and we both kind of went, hmm. And the next thing you know, there we had in 2004, we ended up opening our first project and it wouldn't have happened without UDOT. We also came up with the idea of a river bridge across the Colorado River. Even back then we could tell that the traffic on Highway 191 was not gonna decrease. That was a North American free trade agreement route. And so truck traffic was going to just build and build over time. So we thought, why don't we build a bridge across the Colorado River for bicycles and pedestrians? Well, that was a big pie in the sky idea, <laughs> but we put, it, we put it down on our list. And so this is around, now we're into 2000, 2001, and um, we realized that people are starting to take us seriously. Um, so we decided we have to make a plan. We have to make a, we have to come up with an, we have to put all this down on paper. So we came up with the Grand County Non-Motorized Trails Master Plan, and we came up with the first draft in 2003. So in 2003, we also, I also started the Moab Trails Alliance, which is a 501c3, which would basically give me a job. I was not on the county council anymore, so it would give me a job and enable me to be a grant writer with a business card, um, do lays and work with all of our partners that we were beginning to amass with our different projects. Um, be eyes on the project, like one person in the county who was pretty much overseeing all of the non-motorized stuff that we had going on. Um, and a legitimate contact for our contractors and engineers if they needed to, to get in touch with someone. And it took the pressure off local government for us. It's also when we came up with the, the name, the North Moab Recreation Areas Alternative Transportation Plan which was, um, as it was proposed, a system of bridges and underpasses and pathways um, created to mitigate conflicts between user groups and get the non-motorized traffic segregated from the motors. So we were making, wanted to make it safer for both cars and pedestrians and bikers and hikers. Um, during this time also um, was trust. So we were building trust with all of our land managers. We um, were fully engaged with all of them, CITLA, BLM, Forest Service, National Park Service, Sovereign Lands, all of our projects were crossing all of these jurisdictions. So we had um, full engagement with all of the local officials. We had Horrocks engineers on our side. They would, we could always, they were the engineer of record for the county. And, um, I could always call them and say, I need an estimate for this project, or what do you think about that project? And they were always there for us and they would respond immediately. UDOT was our biggest player, of course. 
and they were um, they they got on board pretty hard and fast. And I have to say, um, none of what we did in Grand County would have been able to happen without them being supportive of our ideas. Um, during this time, the dirt trail work was also going on. The um, non-motorized trail work was beginning to really happen. Um, BLM was really strong in that. I had a I got a call from our recreation branch chief one day, and he said, "Well, Kim." I have this route that I penciled in on a map. Do you want to go out and see if it'll go? And I said, well, sure, let's go. And so we took off and we spent all day out in the Klondike Bluffs area and we followed little tracks and roads and indentations in the, in the terrain. And we ended up putting together the most incredible bike ride, which we, it's still there today. And it's called Baby Steps. And the reason it's called Baby Steps is because it was our first project that we were able to do with the BLM. And that was a huge trust builder because not only did we get to plan it together, then we got to build it together. And we brought in the Inva Trail Care crew to help us build it. And so they could see then that we had, that we were, our intentions were good. Our follow through was excellent. And the work that we did was as good as we could, as they would ever dream of. So we had a great relationship with them. And meanwhile, all this is going on, we're having meeting after meeting after meeting for the bridge and the pathway project that seemed to basically just interminable process. And that's about expectations because I'm not a very patient person, I guess, but um, when I think about the projects that we worked on back in the day, all I could think of is this is taking forever. It's never going to happen. And we'd have a setback and I'd be okay. I guess it's done. And then I'd be like, no, it's not done. And we'd keep going and we'd keep pulling through. And so finally in 2008, we were able to have the grand opening for our bridge across the Colorado river. And it was a great party. The lions club put on a pancake breakfast. We had music, we had dignitaries, we had, um, the ribbon cutting and it was a very emotional time for a lot of us to be able to actually have that event happen and it um it basically spurred a lot of other projects to kick you know to get going faster and so what happened that bridge opened in 2008 then after that in 2010 we were able to open up the moab canyon path which linked the bridge to the north moab recreation areas and it was, for a while, the bridge had been sort of a little bit of a joke of it's the bridge to nowhere because it hadn't been linked anywhere. So it took us two years before we actually had it linked to go up the Moab Canyon and another section opened also um, up the river road, the beginning piece of the Moab path. In 2012, we opened up the pathway from Moab to the bridge and 2014, we opened up the transit hub at the intersection of Highway 191 and 128. In 2016, we opened up the trail hub. And in 2020, we had the Arches pathway open that connected the Moab Canyon path into the visitor center. So all of a sudden, within the span of 15 years, we had a major, we had $22 million worth of projects being built for non-motorized transportation. And it was um, quite an exciting time. And it just seemed like through that process that one completed project sort of begot another. And um, the North Moab Recreation Area's alternative transportation plan just started filling out and really getting people from town all the way out to 313 to the bike path that leads out to Dead Horse Point. So it was a huge network of trails that would keep you completely, it is a huge network that keeps you completely segregated from motorized traffic. Plus it's beautiful out there. So when I think about the title of this presentation, um, let's recreate Grand County. I wouldn't recommend recreating Grand County. I would recommend creating your county or your town because every place has its own specific needs and its own specific um, assets to, to accentuate. So, I have a little problem with um, saying that our way is the best way or our way is, I, I would hate to see any other place look like us. I think we should all just accentuate our individuality. 
but I do have a few things that um, ideas that maybe could help you. Um, first thing is to have an idea and start talking and start talking a lot to your grassroots around you, the people around you, um, your county council people or county commissioners. Um, they need to be brought together. Everybody needs to be able to be included in the process. It makes it a little messy, but that's the way it goes, right? And then you just keep plodding along. And I remember just thinking in, in the process all these years of just pretend it's gonna happen, just keep working like it's going to happen. And then all of a sudden it happens. So you just don't wanna give up on it. Um, it really helps to have friends in high places. It really helped during a lot of that time when we were doing our biggest projects like the bridge and the pathway um, to along 128 to um, be lobbying for state transportation money, from um, state parks money, different things like that. There's all there were all kinds of really valuable sources for grant money that we were able to tap into, um, federal money, state money, local money, <clears throat> and by bringing in your um, grassroots people and your local uh, residents and stuff, you can end up tapping into um, private citizens for grant. Um, for uh, checks <laughs> also. So when you're putting together your funding packages, you don't wanna overlook anybody's ability or um, willingness to contribute. Um, I would also recommend to think long-term about where you, what your goals are, um, how many people you wanna have come to your community and how you want them to visit because it's good to be proactive. You don't wanna be behind the eight ball. Um, like we were in Moab for about 10 minutes. And then we got on board with more toilets at, at the trailheads, um, the transit hubs with facilities for parking and um, bathroom facilities with um, mapping so that people know where to go and how to get there with an open forum at trail mix every week. It's still, been meeting religiously every week since 19 since, since December of 1999. So it's been a huge um, a huge focus for people to be able to bring their energies to those meetings and deal with different issues as they come up. And I'm sure Maddie will talk about those when she starts on the the current state of affairs in Moab. So we've had our growing pains and. I feel like I'm pretty proud of the way that we have worked through them and we'll still have more and, and anybody else who does any big projects like these will too. But basically being able to supply a safe alternative for folks to get around and to recreate is a gift. And if you're gonna invite people to your community, you need to give them a place where they can safely do the activities that you're inviting them to enjoy. So the thing I am the most proud of is our ability to have a, an alternative transportation system that not only serves a commuter to work or somebody that is um, trying to access further out public lands, but also people, who, people in wheelchairs, people who just wanna go out for an afternoon, people who wanna just walk across the bridge and experience the Colorado River like you were never able to before because the shores were clogged with tamarisk or the road, you know, you were on a road and there was too much traffic. And so it's a place actually of respite as well as transit. And so it's a world-class recreational amenity that serves a very important purpose for people's safety and enjoyment. So I think that, um, when you think about these kinds of projects, I would think big <laughs> and long-term and about the gift that you're gonna be giving your community and your visitors. And um, I hope that you all can be as successful and maybe mitigate problems a little earlier than we were able to um, given the experience that we had at the time. So um, good luck. And um, thanks for having me chat. And I hope you got a little information out of this from me. Kim, thank you so much. That's really, really interesting background and, and pretty inspirational too, to just hear how you had 
you know, pie in the sky ideas that have completely come to fruition and, and continue to, to have generational impact. So thanks for, thanks for all that info and thanks for the work that you've done. Um, Maddie, I would like to turn the time over to you now. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to pick up a kind of where Kim left off and let me share my screen with you guys. Okay. Oops. Here we go. Okay. So I started with um, Grand County Active Transportation and Trails, which is kind of the new morph of trail mix, which we'll talk about in a second, in 2016. Um, and so I'm going to really focus on the, the dirt trails, um, the dirt trail network. And when I entered the organization, so, you know, Kim and um, all the folks involved early in trail mix were kind of the pioneers bringing in the non-motorized network. And by the time I arrived, a lot of things had already been put in place. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the transition from the committee model and nonprofit model to the um, to part of the county. So when I joined, um, the trail mix committee had many longtime dedicated volunteers, some of whom are working, I would estimate between like 60 and 70 hours a week on the trails. And then also some longtime dedicated part time staff who are actually under uh, employed under an umbrella nonprofit in town. So the Canyonlands Natural History Association, uh, which is kind of best known for running the gift stores in the national parks. Um, their mission is to support public land managers. So included in that mission was supporting um, the field staff for trail mix for quite a long time. We also, by the time I, I showed up, there was groups that would come year after year um, and donate volunteer time to the trails. So hundreds of hours of, um, of volunteer labor that we could count on to help get projects done. And um, you know, these longtime volunteers and staff, they brought with them a lot of institutional knowledge and a lot of trail building knowledge really specific to this area. So by the time I arrived, the train on the left that you can see, we had all the skills and knowledge and equipment to turn it into the trail you see on the right. Also, Kim talked about this a little bit, but MTA is kind of the partner nonprofit, um, created maps of all the trail networks and had a partnership with the local businesses or has a partnership with the local businesses so that all the proceeds from these map sales go back to trail development uh, and trail maintenance. And so we are still using those funds today to help support us. But back in the day, that was one of like the main sources of income. And as Kim mentioned as well, by 2016, um, Trail Mix had built almost 150 miles of single track trails in addition to equestrian and hiking trails. And so the map on the left, everything circled in yellow is an entire non-motorized trail network that was developed. So Tromix has already built about um, eight whole trail networks by the time I arrived, in addition to all the work that Kim talked about on the um, paved pathways, which is the picture on the right. And you know, these, this, these developments were being recognized. So on the left is an article from Outside Magazine around that time. That's really, the whole article is just about the new trails in Moab and how great they are. Um, and there's also large scale events happening. So outer bike shown on the upper right that was taking place on the trail network. Um, and then there was, uh, you know, guiding companies and uh, races and other large scale events taking place on the trails as well by this time. And what's going on in Moab. So the broader context of all this on the left, you can see a graph that's showing uh, Moab from the 1970s. So kind of a general increase in visitation. And then on the right, this is a graphic from Arches National Park this year that um, basically describes that within the last 10 years, visitation to the parks has doubled. And while this image is um, specific to Arches National Park, it's true of the BLM land around Moab as well. So the current estimate for visitation on uh, BLM land around Moab is three, 3 million visitors annually. So um, because of these changes, there was um, some pressures to restructure the organization. So. You know, when Trail Mix started, they had, you know, with baby steps, they had a few miles of trail um, to maintain, but were primarily focused on trail development. By the time um, they built 150 trail, 150 miles of trails, we were also maintaining all those trails, right? So in addition to new projects, 
uh, we had quite a bit of um, a maintenance load to care for things we'd already built. And then also with that increased visitation, like that graph you saw, there's just a lot more people using the trails, which is a great success. Um, it also just means that you have to account for more wear and tear from more people out there. And so this, um, this increased maintenance load created a pressure for, or really a need for full-time positions. And there were a lot of volunteers who were pretty much working full-time. So it was more about formalizing these positions for the, the long-term um, stability of the organization. And so having full-time positions, that kind of, uh, kind of signified we we're at the point where we were outgrowing the umbrella nonprofit model um, and also required a significantly larger budget because once you go into full-time, you need benefits. Uh, and also um, up until this point, the field staff were using their personal vehicles and their own um, workspace and yard space and storage for all of the materials. And so, for example, when I joined, um, my predecessor had a big truck. I have a Subaru. <laughs> so, you know, there were some areas I really just couldn't, can access right with with just the personal vehicles. So we were starting to see a need for more um, more support, more resources. Fortunately, by this time, as Kim talked about, the Grand County uh, Tromics Committee had been around since 1999, and they had a stellar reputation, you know, both with um, the county and the land managers, and a really long record of getting things done and being reliable. And at, by this point, the non-motorized trails were also recognized. Uh, as an economic asset to the county that needed to be really taken, taken seriously and maintenance needed to be as taken as seriously as you would with um, the county roads, for example. And so this put us in a good spot. In January 1st, uh, 2019, all of the field staff for Tromix who had been previously um, with the, the nonprofit got absorbed into a new county department, which is called Grand County Active Transportation and Trails, which we call GCAT for short, since that doesn't uh, roll off the tongue quite as well as Tromix. And so that brought with it um, two full-time positions and then we're able to bring in all of our, um, our seasonal employees, so three, three staff. And the funding structure changed as well. So it really did give us that little boost and stability that we needed to kind of um, you know, account for all of the increased maintenance and workload. So our primary source of income right now is various tax revenue from the county. And then we still do um, get a lot of funding from map sales at the bike shops, as well as grants and cost share agreements with the BLM and also now the Forest Service. So this is a picture of all of the different trail networks, which as I mentioned, were, were pretty much on, they were on the ground when I started. So um, in the BLM's resource management plan for this area, they had a goal of 150 miles of single track trails that they wanted to build. And at this point, um, those, that, that mileage had pretty much been completed, that goal had been accomplished. So there was some question of, okay, we're, you know, we have um, part of the county, we have resources like that. Oh yeah, that big truck <laughs> and all the other equipment you can see came with our uh, switch to the county. Um, you know, we have staff and we've completed kind of the primary focus of the previous year. So there's a question of what's, what's next for Trail Mix, uh, which was, required you know, a change of focus in the organization. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what we shifted to after completing all that trail development. Um, so as Kim mentioned, the Trail Mix Committee uh, was really composed of um, mountain bikers, hikers, equestrian, and then non-motorized snow sports. But there are also a lot of other users in Moab. And during you know, the last decade, they've been increasing quite a bit. Um, so climbers and canyoneering or canyoneers they become quite a significant user group. Moab is also like a world recognized area for climbing. And so um, 2016 or 2017, we included a, a climbing and canyoneering representative on the committee. And we started to look at areas where there was already a lot of use um, and informal social trails that were at a point where they really needed some climbers. Um, they really needed some attention. So rather than developing a new trail network for recreation, looking at the impacts from current recreation and trying to mitigate those impacts. So on the right is the cover of um, High on Moab, which came out in 2015. And so this, um, this new guidebook, you know, it really, there's already climbers in the area, but suddenly we started to see a lot more climbers and a lot of people going to areas that had previously just seen local use. So on the right is a typical climbing access trail. It's a trail that was probably sustainable when there's, you know, just a few people on it. But then at this point, um, is becoming eroded and starting to see plant die off just because there's an increased number of users. 
and so this is a before and after of that particular spot. So on the left is the um, what it looked like when we got there, and then on the right with a nice new staircase. And um, here's some photos just of involvement from the climbing community. So there was quite a lot of support from the community for these projects. Um, we also partnered with the American Alpine Club to have an annual event. And on the top right are some um, real life climbers using the trail as we're building it. So um, kind of just demonstrates that these were areas already seeing heavy use that needed more infrastructure. We also uh, expanded our partnership to start working up in the mountains in the La Salles with the Forest Service. And so um, what we could offer the Forest Service is that our trail crew is really specialized in mountain bike trail design and trail layout. So on the left, that's us last summer doing a reroute. Um, so our staff did the, did the layout and the construction and kind of trained their trail crew. Um, and we're also specialized in uh, technical rock work. So that's actually me standing on top of a big wall we built last summer on a switchback. And then what we get out of it is um, before, through the cost share agreement, the Forest Service is able to reimburse us for all of those costs. So we're able to offer our employees um, an extension to their season so they can stay through the summer if they would like. And also the Forest Service has a lot of experience with um, building wood structures, which is something we don't do a lot down in the desert. So it's good training for us um, to learn from them. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about maintenance because I've um, <laughs> kept mentioning how much, how much maintenance we do, but um, what does that actually mean? So there's um, kind of two main categories, I would say. There's improvements within trail networks. So that involves building new trails, but it's not like whole new trail development. It's more once things have been on the ground for a while and you see how people are using them, you have to make some adjustments and tweaks. So that includes um, you know, adding new trails for connectivity, uh, mitigating any safety issues that might have come up and also dealing with any new trail user conflict. Um, and then there's the maintenance, which is, you know, forces of nature and user created damage, which we'll talk about. And that's um, our operations coordinator, Tyson, having a, um, a light bulb go off about his, about a new improvement to a trail network. So this is the Amasabak trail system. And this is a prime example of a trail network that needed a little bit of tweaking. So on the top right, the Amasabak Trailhead parking lot, um, that's where you park. And then, can you guys see my mouse if I move it around? Yep. yep. Okay, great. Um, so right over here where my mouse is, so that's where the trail network actually starts. So up until just a few years ago, you'd park here, you'd go up this road, and then you'd enter from up here and go and connect to the trail network. Um, but with the increase in bike riders and hikers and also the motorized use on that road, it was, be it was becoming uh, quite a bit of a user conflict. So this photo here shows um, it's a line of school children that had, they just got off a school bus. This, was, this happened while we were out there um, scouting the project. So a whole line of elementary school students, and then there's a whole line of razors going past them on the road. So not an ideal situation. Um, and so we put in a connector trail which is this green line here that just connects that parking area to the rest of the trail network. And while we were at it, we threw in a, a climbing access trail to this area as well. So there were some, some parking issues developing. Uh, one of our current projects is extending what we're calling the Raptor route, which is an alternative ending to the whole enchilada network. The whole enchilada gets about 24,000 users per year. And the last section of it, um, it's a 36, 37 mile route, starts in the mountains, ends back in Moab. Um, and the last section, the Porcupine Rim single track is extremely technical and it's also very remote. So um, we have been seeing an increase in search and rescues in that area because people are exhausted, they might be having mechanical issues. And then by the time it all catches up with them, they're in an area that's really hard to access and often involves a helicopter and like a full day of search and rescue staff out there. So um, the goal of this project was when people get to this this point here when they can decide if they're going to take the really challenging but really famous beautiful single track um, or they're going to take the sand flats road down to town we wanted to give people another option so that they could take a single track route separated from traffic still beautiful um, but a bit more moderate and then also has a lot better access both for search and rescue to get to people and then also for people to get out to the road if they need to so this is called the raptor route it's in purple and these are the, the sections we've constructed. Uh, this fall, we're connecting these two sections and actually extending this trail down a bit lower. 
And just because it's sort of a, you know, I guess you'd call it a connector trail doesn't mean it's not a world-class trail. So here's a picture of it. Um, it's quite beautiful. Okay, so maintenance. <laughs> so there's a few kinds of maintenance we do. Uh, routine maintenance is, you know, what we would call, you know, just, just the work of gravity and water over time. So what you're seeing here on the before and after, that's a lot of what we're doing out there on the trails, just to keep them in good shape. Um, but it can also, for in our area, involve quite a bit of heavy duty maintenance. So routine maintenance can also include these big technical projects, which um, every five to eight years, I would say, we have to go in and, and work a little bit on these big rock structures. Uh, it also can include the more um, <laughs> forceful uh, aspects of nature. So on the left is a big boulder that's fallen on the trail and blocked it. On the right is a big washout from a flash flood. So, you know, these are incidents that, um, you know, we've, got, we've gotten used to this now, but it's always a bit of a surprise. Sometimes things just happen really quickly and you have to have staff available to go out there right away to clean it off or fix it up. So this one shows our, our bridge being washed out here last summer. And then finally, um, so I have asterisk next to this user created damage because this is really what's become a major focus of ours as, as visitation has increased. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of um, impact just from trail users and not all of it's intentional. Most of it is just folks who aren't familiar with the area and familiar with the special um, needs of our ecosystem here. So the desert here is quite fragile. And what that means is if one person rides off trail that can, um, create a lot of uh, very long-term damage for the area. And also the marks remain visible. So we have an issue where someone rides off trail and unless we go out and we manually remove those tracks with a rake, um, other people tend to follow those. And then before you know it, you have a social trail or a you know, trail braiding, trail widening. So here's some examples of um, us raking out tracks. <laughs> this is for our new handbook actually we're putting out for volunteers. But basically just trying to disguise those tracks so they don't become um, an issue with people repeating it. And then down below here, we have a before and after of a social trail we've rehabilitated and an example of lining along the trail to help delineate it. So this is an example of a classic trail braiding project we would work on. Um, you can see how quickly those social trails get burned in. So you can't even really distinguish which is the um, which trail you're supposed to be on at this point their crew at work. And here's the before and after. So I would say this is becoming uh, the majority of our, our maintenance load out there on the trails at this point. But the good news is there's some things we can do about it. So, you know, we kind of realized from just being out on the trail, working on this type of, these types of projects and talking to people that there really is, it's not really malicious behavior so much. It really is just people not knowing, you know, they're coming from Ohio, they're coming from Germany. They just don't really know that, you know, for us, off trail tracks can be such of a big issue. So when I started in 2016, we started to really emphasize the educational aspect. Um, and what that included was we realized that we actually just didn't have like the basic graphics and images we needed to describe to people, um, you know, the, the etiquette that we wanted them to follow. So these are some graphics that we developed on the top. And then below, this one's for hiking, but this shows a little demonstration of what it looks like when trails start to braid and widen. We also expanded our social media. So um, trying to focus on the planning ahead and preparing aspect of uh, minimum impact practices. So for example, if someone drives all the way uh, from Denver to Moab and they get here and the trails are muddy, they're probably gonna ride the trails because they've already committed a lot of energy to get here. So trying to reach out to the public and be like, don't come here this weekend, the trails are muddy, please don't ride them. Also, um, e-bikes are a new user group on the trails. And so we uh, worked to develop a pamphlet that shows all the areas that you can go e-biking and recommended routes to kind of clarify that issue since um, it is a new user group. And also how I mentioned with the whole enchilada, we put all this effort into building um, a new trail network. So we also have been working on improving the access to information for folks before they get here about the different routes so that they know that that new trail we built exists. Um, safety concerns, and then a map that emphasizes all the exits, right? So that we don't get people who pass the final exit point and then end up um, on that, that area where there's search and rescues and, and not realizing that there's not a, a bailout back to town. 
Okay, we are getting close to the end here, just so you guys know. So all of those graphics I showed you just a few slides ago. So this is what we incorporated them into. So this is our trailhead signage. So we're trying to catch people before they get to Moab, maybe when they're in the bike shops with pamphlets. And then now they're at the trailhead having more information about um, trail etiquette, how to help protect this area, how to help protect the trails. Oops, get that one. Um, we also, this year, we just launched a trail ambassador program. So we now have an additional full-time position. This person is managing our trail ambassadors who are out at trailheads on the trails at both hiking and biking trails. And they're just talking to visitors about, you know, how they can minimize their impact. Uh, they're also offering them information, offering them water if they don't have water. Um, and kind of, you know, they're like the walking billboards, basically. So they're communicating all the same information as the trailheads, but it's a lot more effective when it's in person. And here's another photo. So last week was our, or last year was our pilot program. So we had just six weeks of folks out in the field and it just had great results. Um, they just talked to so many people. We got great feedback about it. So this year we've expanded the program to spring, summer, and fall. And a few takeaways. So um, kind of combining what Kim, Kim said into what I said. So it really was a long process of organizing the community and building those relationships with land managers before all of the um, trail, trail development took place. So, it, so the actual step of putting all these trails on the ground, all the dirt trails happened really quickly, but there was a lot of um, groundwork laid before that point. Um, also the model where it was, you know, the volunteer committee and part-time staff and volunteers, that was extremely successful for a long time. Um, and then, you know, it was only after we'd really constructed quite a lot of trail that we started to have a need to, um, you know, grow the organization. And with that change, you know, trying to find new, um, new goals for the organization. So expanding the user groups, the types of people out on the trail, um, where we worked, and then also trying to um, really address that if you become a successful recreation area, your popularity means that you're gonna have, um, by definition, you're just gonna have more impact from people out there. And so really trying to get on, ahead of how to manage that with education. Okay. So, I don't have any questions. Maddie, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Um, kind of to, to one of your last points, I think something that I pulled out from both presentations, both you and Kim, is just the importance of managing expectations. And that's both for the users as well as the people behind the projects making it happen that, yeah, you can, you can push and you can get a lot done, um, but you do need to have some patience as well along the way um, because things, things take time. Um, so let's go ahead. Um, if you have questions that you want to put in the chat, please feel free to put them in the chat. And if you want, if you'd rather just um, verbalize your question, just please raise your hand um, so we can make sure we don't have people talking over each other. But let's open it up to questions to, to these two experts. And I will, as we have questions, oh, I don't see. I see Betsy's hand up. Betsy, can you, do you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself? Yeah, hi, hi Maddie, hi Kim. I just wondered um, a little bit for this group, like how um, trail committees and trail groups can work with communities to connect those trails to like on-street facilities, to community centers, things like that, so that people um, don't necessarily have to drive to trails, but can connect more easily um, just by riding their bike. Kim, do you want to take that one? Uh, I'll start and then I'm sure Maddie can add to it. <clears throat> um, well, that is one thing that we have done in Moab is connecting people to the North Moab recreation areas. So if you are a strong rider, you can ride from town out to a lot of our trails. Um, if you're not, um, I think our community is trying to figure out a shuttle service, different types of shuttle services. And um, we've attempted it before, but it seems like now is the time when maybe we will be able to start having shuttles. But um, otherwise, yeah, my goal would be to not ever have to get in a car and just be able to pedal wherever I wanna go. So we're working on it. I think it's just a question of money and um, identifying the, the need in your own community. 
Mm -hmm. I would, yeah, I would just add that it's definitely a current challenge. And I think um, part of that is just because Moab's gotten to the point where uh, there's been a lot of development in downtown the last, you know, five to 10 years. And so um, getting easements for private property is more challenging than it was maybe a decade ago. Um, so trying to figure out how to get those in-town connections is a little bit of a challenge. Thank you. Um, a question that came in through the chat that I just want to verbalize for the purposes of the recording. Um, what do you see as the primary challenges when it comes to multi-use as the population grows? I can, you want me to take that one, Kim? Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I would say we're actually remarkably lucky. Like when I talk to folks who have my position in other communities, we actually um, are doing really well with how little, like it's surprising how little uh, user conflict we have overall. And a lot of that is because the BLM had in their resource management plan, they did a, a really great job of, um, they designated different focus areas. So really from like the very beginning, separating out the different trail networks so that we don't have everyone kind of squished into the same areas. And we can do that in Moab because we have so much public land. So, you know, there's mountain bike focus areas, there's hiking focus areas, there's equestrian focus areas. And that's really um, allowed us to avoid a lot of problems. I would say, you know, e-bikes are new user group. So that's definitely probably the up and coming user conflict. And, you know, I guess the idea of, are we gonna try and, um, you know, combine networks or do e-bikes really need like their own, their own space to prevent user conflict, their own focus areas. Um, I will, I'd add to that, that um, it's an evolution. You know, this whole process it changes as you've seen through both of our present or both of our um, presentations. It's, you know, the e-bike is definitely a, a big consideration. And I have a feeling that it is going to um, create another need that will have to be addressed in the future. Thank you. Uh, another question just came in. Are there other specific communities you look to for inspiration or ideas? Well, back in the day when we were said, you know, when we were getting, we had, we had like three or four trails and then all of a sudden Fruta, Colorado decided to jump on the bandwagon and their BLM just said, go out and build all these trails. And our thing was, well, fruit is eating our lunch and we got to get busy. And that's when we kicked all of our trail stuff into gear in 2003, basically, and started um, saying, well, we can, I don't want to say we can do better than that, but we did. <laughs> A little bit of some, some healthy competition in the attitude. <laughs> Maddie, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I would just say that right now we're looking into updating our non-motorized trails master plan. And so we've been looking a lot at Cache County's master plan, which is just really excellent, really user-friendly. So I think that's something we want to try and copy from them. They, yeah, they've, they've certainly done an incredible job there. Um, I know we've got just a couple minutes left um, to allow for, for a couple minutes of break between the, the two sessions, um, but I just wanted to Make sure there are no outstanding questions in the chat or if anyone wants to raise their hands. And something, if, if anyone does have any other questions, feel free to put them in, but something I would just like to, to highlight, I think that came through in both of your presentations is just um, that, that I thought was, was super interesting is realizing the sustainability, not just for like the trails itself and working on the maintenance of them, um, whether it's, you know, a simple reroute to there was a natural disaster, we have to get out and fix this immediately, to um, educating users and trying to get out ahead of, of, of some of those maintenance issues that might not need to occur, um, but also just the sustainability of your staff and making sure that you have the equipment that you need, um, getting a truck, things like that, um, I think was, was really important for anyone out there who's thinking about similar ideas, um, just, I guess, like, like Kim said earlier, think long-term um, and with that sustainability. Yeah, I would definitely add to that and just say that I'm really glad we did uh, transition into a county department because I think, you know, as Moab's growing and changing, I think with rent prices increasing, it's really hard for people um, or it's less sustainable for people to really be having a full-time volunteer position. 
kind of at a point where people really need to have stable employment so they can um, afford to be living in town. So we were just ahead of the curve, I feel like, and got our uh, full-time positions in um, and, and stabilized everything. So we're not having any issues with the retaining staff. Yeah, very important to note. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. Um, but I, I do know between sessions, we're trying to give a few minutes of a break for, for people joining. Um, so with that, Heidi, I will go ahead and turn it back to you unless we have any final words from our presenters. 